today, the, the last uh, presentation is by Professor Raul Vicente. He, he was a lazy man at Max Planck Institute in Germany in brain research. I think has been doing postdocs there for six years or more. Several Estonian young uh, talented uh, kids were collaborating with him, including Johan Aru, I think, and uh, Christian Gorius. And they wanted uh, desperately to propose that let's attract Raul to Estonia. And when, after we, we were successful in attracting him uh, as a researcher, as a junior group leader, he is now a full professor in here and has uh, been serving as attraction point for many uh, Estonian AI uh, interested researchers as well as brain research in here, computation and neuroscience. So, uh, we will see about complex systems for computer science. So thank you, Jack, for the, for the introduction. And I must start by saying that I'm a bit embarrassed that I'm here since almost 10 years, and it's my first ESCAS. Uh, but that makes it also more exciting, and, and uh, I'm really looking forward for the rest of the, of the sessions. And yeah, uh, maybe the local people or the local students associate me more with teaching of uh, neural networks, artificial neural networks, and deep learning, and reinforcement learning. And they might be a bit surprised why I, I will be talking today about uh, complex systems, um, in particular complex systems for computer scientists. And one of the reasons is that, um, well, as Jack explained a little bit before, uh, before coming here, I was in, in Germany, uh, in an institute uh, dealing with, uh, with brains, in an institute for brain research. Is this the, the pointer? Oh, yeah, now it works. Thank you. So as I said, I was, uh, yeah, okay. So I was working uh, as a postdoc for seven years in, a, in an institute for brain research, and as I would like to argue later on, I would say that brain, most people find the brain, of course, one of the most prototypical examples of complex systems. And before that, that doesn't qualify enough, before that I, w I did my PhD in an institute that has complex systems in the, in the title. So let me see. Yeah. So they're in Mallorca in Spain, and there I was working for an institute uh, on interdisciplinary physics and complex systems. And there people uh, were studying and continue studying uh, all types of complex systems related to, uh, for example, finding patterns and emerging patterns in interactions between many, many agents in a distributed manner without any central organizer or coordinator. So they were studying how opinions form and spread in uh, social media, for example, uh, in fluids or even lasers, uh, semiconductor laser. I was about to tell the example with a pointer laser, but now they substitute with this digital thingy. But in the normal laser pointer is a semiconductor laser and even though it looks tiny, actually patterns and formations uh, form in the surface of this tiny semiconductor laser. So basically, you can find a structure in many different uh, disciplines, in many different objects, and somehow there is some sort of new science uh, called complexity science that tries to study how many elements that are distributed without any central organizer can form these patterns, these long scales of order uh, that go beyond the typical range of interaction between these elements that form the pattern. And as I said, this can occur in biological systems, in social systems, in physical systems, in all type of, of science and discipline. Seems that this doesn't really work. Uh, it's not a problem, I can press, it's totally okay. But meanwhile, uh, so that's why uh, today I would like to tell you a bit about complex systems. But the second part of the title of the talk uh, has to do with why I would like to tell this to computer scientists. Okay? And one of the reasons is that one of the early examples of a study of complex systems was carried out by, by Alan Turing himself. And in that case, uh, Turing, which you don't see in the screen, but is here. Um, they made it more complex. Yeah. <laughs> Everything worked before, I must say. Uh, but yeah, maybe this is an example of complex system. Um, so Alan Turing himself uh, was interested in also how uh, in the skin of animals, that 
have these spots and these structures. It was curious because uh, these patterns, again, are very much, much longer than the typical cells or the pigments in cells. So he wondered, again, how these large structures, these large scale patterns can appear from the interaction between elements without any central organizer, and how can they can distribute and structure themselves in these, again, huge scale patterns in comparison with the size of the cells or the pigments in the skin of the, the animals. How can these patterns appear without any uh, central organizer? So this is uh, some question that keep uh, bothering him. Uh, and again, again, you can see it can, uh, can occur in, uh, in the skin of animals. These patterns here, you can see this pigmentation on the skin of these animals. Also in shells, you see these uh, amazing patterns that some of them look a cellular automata, uh, maybe you know this one dimensional cellular automata, some rules of them produce this type of patterns very similarly. So again, he got interested in question like how this pattern can form, again, from the mediate of interaction of cells interacting only short scale, very short distance, how they can form this huge pattern that engages scales which are millions and millions larger than the size of these elements and the range of their interactions. Um, and at the end, he formulated some, some equations for reaction diffusion uh, equations, which somehow explain why the pattern of constant pigmentation or the uh, very mixed pattern of, uh, let's say, noisy uh, pigments are, were not stable, but rather the pattern that was stable, the pattern that attracted uh, the dynamics of this pigmentation and the very simple and local rules uh, was able to produce this, this sort of uh, stripes and circles and different uh, sort of larger scale pigmentations in the skins of animals. So again, here he came with an example of a plausible biological simple local rule that somehow uh, was able to explain these, again, large, large patterns. From a system that didn't have any central uh, organizer or any master element indicated where each of these pigments or chemical should go into the skin of the animal. Again, it was some sort of order of self uh, or a spontaneous appearance of, of order due to local and distributed interactions between many, many, many elements, okay? And, um, and this is one example of one of the early studies of what we call now the Turing patterns, and it's considered one of the early examples of complex systems, but I think all of you recognize, to some degree, uh, other complex systems. Uh, for example, a colony of ants, as you can see in the screen, a school of fishes, uh, these flocks of birds, even neurons in a, in a brain, all of them share some elements. They are very different, they belong to different disciplines. Here they share the commonality that they are all about living animals, but we will see also some examples in non-living animals that share some characteristics. In this case, there are many, many elements. Each of them is relatively simple. It follows very simple and local rules uh, without any master, and they are able to form this, again, this large-scale structure and order. This order appears out of the interaction of elements each of them relatively simple, okay? And of course, in the case of ants, it's fascinating for, for many people and they form this huge structure, these, these bridges sometimes. Some species of ants can, can even build some sort of boats in which they transport themselves to uh, faraway regions. Uh, termites, as you know, build these cathedrals. None of them knows what it's doing in some sense. They all follow in simple local rules, but at the end, they create these amazing uh, patterns. And as I said, living animals, of course, is one of the source of, of these uh, incredible patterns, but this can be applied to many other uh, systems. Uh, for example, the evolution of the road network in cities, again, follows certain patterns, certain global statistics are respected, even though in the, the, the creation of these road networks is not centralized. Different mayors propose different roads here and there. It's nothing so centralized, when, especially over the span of 500 years. And nevertheless, there is some patterns, there is some statistics that these structures, when they grow, they follow almost militarily. Uh, and also, complex systems, uh, for example, are useful to describe how people with small biases or small tendencies can somehow, again, self-organize, and here is the critical word, self-organize, into, for example, clear distinctions. Here is, for example, distribution of people of different races, I think in a some US city, and you can see clearly borders. Uh, and again, the science of complexity tries to study how these patterns are formed from maybe small bias or small uh, preferences, how the aggregation of these small preferences can form these huge blocks or uh, arrangements in cities, for example. So the science of cities has also been, for example, very much shaped by complex system science. <coughs> 
And again, I put here some examples, but you can think, I guess, of many, uh, many, many other examples. So complexity science, at the end, is the science of the emergence of order of uh, on the structures. Uh, typically in systems uh, that are, as I said, numerous systems interacting uh, without any central organizer and uh, distributed. And it, it, um, it drinks from several disciplines. It takes tools and concepts for several disciplines. Uh, network theory is one that is very, very popular since uh, several, several decades. Uh, in the study of complex systems, uh, complex networks, sorry, like social networks, uh, networks of the World Wide Web, how these networks grow, what patterns they follow when they grow. They have some sort of universal laws. Uh, evolution and adaptation is another case, is another uh, feature of complex systems. Normally they adapt, the systems learn over time. The systems make predictions, and these predictions in turn, turn, in turn change how the systems behave. Uh, pattern formation, I gave the example of Turing uh, with this uh, pattern formation, how structures appear again in systems uh, without any master. Uh, it reads also from many concepts from uh, system theory. One way to quantify complexity and other notions uh, are rooted in information theory, for example, and entropy and some measures of complexity uh, are inspired by, by information theory. Dynamical systems and nonlinear dynamics is how we model and we understand different qualitative behaviors in systems that uh, follow some trajectory over time. So the notions of chaos, of uh, the edge between chaos and order, uh, bifurcation theory, all these notions of qualitative behavior to try to understand uh, at least the qualitative behavior of some systems. Uh, again, nonlinear dynamics and, and dynamical systems. Uh, game theory, especially iterative games, also are some frameworks to, to understand uh, some complex systems. And also, finally, collective behavior, or especially animal collective behavior, is also one very interesting source of patterns. So all I, what I'm saying is that complexity science or complex systems is by nature a very interdisciplinary uh, science. It takes concepts and tools and quantifications from, from many different uh, areas. But nevertheless, it is still is a science in itself. It's not only I am going to study some system in some other discipline and you just study systems in different disciplines. There is some sort of unity or invariance because some of these systems look very different on the surface, but some of them have some invariance, some common mechanism, some sort of common regularities in the statistical level and also the level of mechanism. So some of them have some, as I said, this common mechanism, and that's what kind of unifies, or one can talk about the science of complex systems. And again, um, why to speak this to computer scientists in particular, why I would like to raise this, this, this topic and make an invitation uh, to the challenge of also joining to study some sort of complex systems. Uh, it's also because uh, computer scientists have been involved in, in complexity science uh, since a long time, and I think it's a very nice intuition that they bring and the tools that they bring. And it has been, as I said, from Turing uh, almost 80 or 90 years ago, uh, and it continues being the case. Um, but now the, the highlight spot of complex system science is in Santa Fe, with an institute formed in, the, I think, 83 or 84, the Santa Fe Institute uh, in this city in New Mexico, in the USA. And there, a couple of Nobel Prize and other prominent people decided that it was time to, to build an institute in which uh, to study complex systems. And there is where the, the best uh, scientists in complex science uh, visit. And, um, and the list of people who somehow have been associated with this institute, uh, it's uh, in one way or another, as founders or visitors, or it's, uh, it's really impressive. Uh, here you have uh, one of the founders, like Murray Gilman, Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, Kenneth Arrow, also Nobel Prize in Economy. So the list of people who have been studying or is studying comp complex systems is really, uh, is really impressive. And in this list, uh, you will find also some, um, some computer scientists. Uh, from this list, for example, I highlight here uh, Melanie Mitchell, uh, who has been uh, um, studying artificial intelligence and the concept of analogy. She was a student of Douglas Hofstadter and is a computer scientist. Uh, an early uh, AI researcher, John Holland, one of the fathers of uh, evolutionary algorithms, of, of genetic algorithms. Uh, Herbert Simon, early pioneer in AI, and also I think he won the Nobel Prize in Economy. Uh, Stephen Wolfram, of course you know him also uh, from the Mathematica software, but also he was early pioneer in the study of cellular automata and in classifying them. Uh, Chris Moore, theoretical computer scientist. So as you can see, the list of people who is uh, studying or have been interested in complex systems. John Holland himself wrote a book about complex systems and emergencies. 
involves computer scientists. And I think sometimes uh, in the curriculum we, we don't see enough maybe of some of these features, or amazing features that these complex systems are able to produce, this order, these structures, that, these patterns that they are able to, to emerge from simple interaction and simple rules. And I think it would be nice uh, perhaps to recover part of this. Um, and therefore the, why this talk is entitled like it is. Uh, so what I would like to tell uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes or so, it's a little bit about the definition of complex systems. Uh, and you will see it's, it's very difficult to define or to pin mathematically uh, what a complex system is. Therefore, part of the talk will be kind of vague because complex scientists have not been able to unify or to agree on a common definition of complex systems. But nevertheless, we will see some examples and hope with that, those examples, you will be able to see what, is, what they have in common, many of them. Then we will talk about the products of complex system. What are the, these examples of order, spontaneous order, uh, and emergence uh, that they, they produce? Then I will choose the example of a scaling, as some sort of uh, pattern or some sort of law that many complex systems follow. And at the end, I will discuss a little bit why complex systems, not only computers, but complex systems also can be said to be compute something, okay? And we will finish with some discussion and questions on which perspectives this, this opens in complex systems. Okay, so let's start with the, with the definition of what is a complex system. So uh, probably if you ask complex scientists, uh, better say scientists who study complex systems, um, each of them will come with a different definition of what a complex system is. And indeed, that was the case almost when in the cover of, well, in the special issue in science in 99, they asked eight different groups, eight different researchers to define complex systems, and they came with eight different definitions. One of the definitions, for example, is that, okay, a complex system is a system in which large populations of units or elements can self-organize into aggregations that generate pattern, store information, and engage in collective decision-making. This was one of the definitions by some of the prominent authors issued in that, in that volume. Another proposed that complex systems are those systems with multiple elements adapting or reacting to the pattern that these elements create themselves. So here they are alluding to some sort of feedback between the pattern that these elements, thanks to the interactions, are creating and somehow how this pattern fits back and shapes the further the interactions that these elements will have with each other. So here they are alluding on some sort of feedback between the scales, the pattern that the elements create, and how this again shapes back the local interactions that the element uh, have. And it's this feedback loop that has been claimed to be providing uh, the difficulty, the intrinsic difficulty in predicting or understanding complex system, because this feedback again, as I said, you have some interactions, create some pattern, overall pattern in many cases, and this shapes back again the local interactions, and this shapes again which pattern you're going to create at the larger scale, and back and forth. And, and with these feedback loops, of course, it's very difficult to predict which finally pattern is going to be the, uh, the attractor, is going to, the system dynamics is going to stabilize. Whenever you have feedback between nonlinear elements, it's very difficult to predict uh, what is going to be the final behavior. But okay, this, as I said, here are two definitions, but there were eight in that, in that volume each of them different. Uh, so still, today, we don't have a concrete definition of complex system, but I think uh, most of people recognize examples of, of them. So perhaps the analogy of what we like a definition or is this one when the Supreme Court Justice uh, Potter Stewart in a case in which he had to, uh, to deal to, to, this, to judge whether some that the images were considered as porn or not. He said, uh, look, I really cannot define this. It's very hard, but uh, I know it when I see it. So sometimes some, some things are easier to recognize rather than define. And I think people have applied this analogy or this metaphor to complex systems. Sometimes it's very difficult to define. We still don't have a definition of what is a complex system that the community agrees. But I think most of people in complex systems uh, recognize uh, the elements uh, that a complex system has. And some of the features uh, that complex systems uh, display or properties that have uh, most of complex systems uh, are these four elements. Uh, these are not neither necessary, neither sufficient conditions to something qualify for a complex system and the, have this emergence of patterns that I mentioned before. But I think most of people would agree that uh, many complex systems have 
uh, several elements in this list. The first element is numerosity. As I said, normally complex systems, we, we refer to systems which are composed by many, many, many elements that interact with each other in a myriad of interactions. So this sort of distributed, decentralized systems with many relatively simple elements that nevertheless contain or have uh, numerous interactions. Then, uh, normally, uh, we also talk about some feature complex systems when these elements are sometimes are diverse, so they don't need to be exactly the same. And certainly they are either disordered, maybe it's a bad word here, but it should be maybe better decentralized. Okay? For talking about complex systems, most people agree that it shouldn't be a master element dictating what the others do. It shouldn't be a central element organizing uh, the interactions of others. So normally we refer to complex systems to systems that are by nature distributed without a following any master or leader in their dynamics. Also, uh, the elements uh, normally interact with feedback. So how one element interacts with the other, and this other element with another, this can, there are some cycles or something that can cycle back. So uh, allowing for loops or feedback in the interactions. And this uh, immediately amounts that the past interactions will shape uh, present interactions. So what one element did to its network can cycle back and shape how you interact now with the next element. So always or almost always uh, they contain uh, this feedback and uh, loop elements. And further, the last one is that in many cases there are systems operating out of thermodynamic equilibrium, meaning that there is some sort of gradient of energy or matter into the system. And this is also what allows that uh, they can create order. If the systems would be isolated, if the system would be without any support or gradient of energy or matter, the second law of thermodynamics would say that the system will tend to increase its disorder or increase its entropy. What allows the system to generate order is because they trade it for energy being injected into the system. Okay? So most of the systems also uh, need to have this uh, operating far, or not far, but not in the thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay? In thermodynamic equilibrium, they would tend to the most disorder um, distribution but with the injection or gradient of energy or matter, they can create disorder without violating the second law of thermodynamics. Okay? So they are open systems uh, feeding from energy and that they can use to, to create order uh, spontaneously. And again, some of these elements, uh, numerosity, uh, feedback, um, lack of central element or lack of master uh, dictating the dynamics and operating out of equilibrium or consuming energy or matter, you can find it in each of these pictures, for example. Mm -hmm. And again, many of them really uh, operate with very simple rules. With very, uh, each of them is really following in these cases. For example, in the case of the flock of birds, oops, in the case of the flock of birds here, the proposed dynamics that these elements follow uh, it's very simple that each bird basically uh, takes a fly direction that is some sort of average of the neighboring birds. They follow very simple rules like this. Sometimes they contain two or, two or three elements in this rule, but there are rules as simple as that one in many cases. So again, each bird, for example, in this flock, uh, how this is model, how this is formalized into equations or rules that give patterns very similar to this one, again, is very, very simple. Every bird follows some sort of rule or decides to fly it in a, in a rule that depends only on the neighboring birds around, around it. And if you iterate this without any bird leading this flock, without any bird being the, the master that everyone follows or anything like that, with the iteration of these very simple rules, you find that uh, these flocks, these patterns, these clouds uh, are spontaneously formed from these very simple local rules. Yeah? So uh, I was wondering, uh, it's a little bit like maybe uh, non-relevant to the exact uh, topic, but uh, um, I was wondering, like flock of bird is like a little bit, uh, I don't know, like what's the purpose? Uh, for example, with the fish, we know like they want to avoid uh, big uh, kind of attacks or uh, brain, we know like brain pr uh, serves a purpose. Uh, 
or ants like uh, they mm -hmm. do some work <laughs> around mm -hmm. uh, but like uh, what's the purpose is there any properties of the complex systems that uh, can be categorized or kind of identified based on their purpose it's difficult to say that because so some of the complex systems just evolve through evolution and then the purpose the big purpose would be to survive but to do that of course they can create some sub functions so to say so it really depends if the complex system we are discussing is, is a life system and therefore the big purpose would be again survival or reproduction uh, but a specific purpose, like for example, in the case of the flock of birds, I really don't know what is the purpose of creating these this sort of patterns, what is the function. So I don't think there is some sort of universal uh, from complex systems that can explain what is the function. Maybe this is not the purpose of complex systems. Uh, in the case of evolution, as I said, you really have to follow the evolutionary history of the different organs of the, of the animal to understand what role they occupy. I mean, complex system is not so much about that. It's about the description of how some patterns emerge from simple interactions. Uh, the purpose or the function of these uh, rules, I guess this has to be more uh, specifically studied in each subdiscipline or in each discipline in which the system belongs to. I don't think there is some sort of universal or invariance uh, theory about how uh, complex systems achieve their function. Uh, this is very domain specific, I would say, in principle. And sometimes uh, you will see that these local simple rules, in many cases, they are advantages for the group of, uh, of animals or insects or uh, but in other cases, of course, it's, uh, it's pathological. So it leads to behavior that is not appropriate, you know, some behavior that is uh, maladapted. So, um, but here, I guess, the lesson is that complex behaviors, complex patterns can appear from very, very simple rules. Uh, it's not the case that for a complex pattern, you need complex rules, so to say. Uh, complexity can emerge from simplicity. That would be one of the, of the slogans in complex science. So as I said, there are numerous. From the former pictures, you see that all these examples contain many, many, many elements uh, uh, giving rise to patterns or to larger scales, much bigger than the elements themselves. Uh, the second, uh, yeah, I'm just exemplifying the features that I mentioned before. So the second would be the lack of central coordinator. So this does not happen every morning in a colony of ants, that one of them tells, has a meeting with the others and tells them what to do. Uh, so uh, again, not even the queen, the queen is just down in the, in the nest, uh, laying legs around some hundreds per day. So it's not really, nobody's really dictating what they do. Um, so they really follow simple local rules, and at least that's how we understand most of this complex behavior. About feedback, uh, as I said, the history of interactions circles back. Again, this is, uh, is some ant trail in which, of course, this, this structure that they create or this road that they create or this trail that they create, of course, is going to shape how the next neurons, uh, next ants are going to interact. They are going to follow this pattern because previous ants generated this pattern. Uh, so, of course, uh, there is a huge feedback between what uh, ants did in the past to what the new ants are going to do now. Uh, so, again, it's how the group dynamics shapes the in local interaction between the elements of the group. Um, and as I said, sometimes this doesn't go correctly. Like sometimes, as you know, these spirals or circles of death. Again, here the, the ants are following very simple local rules. But when this uh, trail close, they can have the issue that they just go into circles, 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 and they die out of exhaustion. Uh, so, yes, the same species is able to generate these bridges. That we think, oh my God, how clever they are. But again, each of them is probably not that clever, right? Each of them doesn't know even that it's generating a bridge. And this is a good example in which the same rules with some small topological effect, in this case, closing the loop, leads them to die. So sometimes intelligence can appear out of group behavior, uh, but it shows you that uh, each of them is not that, that clever in that sense uh, or doesn't know what it's engaging in. And as I said, they, they do this, uh, these circles and they die. Uh, when they engage in, this, in these loops. Hmm? And finally, the last point, uh, so we have feedback, and then the last point is uh, this out of equilibrium. Of course, these systems need to consume energy. Uh, otherwise, they could not create any order. In a sense, they are trading energy for order. That's what most of living systems uh, do. But again, the point is that non-living systems can also do this trade and can also generate spontaneous order or these patterns that you see. So 
uh, these were about some features. And again, none of, not this list of four is not neither a necessary, neither a sufficient list of features that to qualify for complex systems, but many of them share them. Uh, and examples, com usual examples consider complex systems. As I said, neurons in nervous systems uh, is considered a prototypical complex systems. It follows uh, these four rules and more, uh, these four features and more. Uh, cities, how cities grow, how cities compete for population. Again, this can be seen as a complex systems. Eusocial insects, as we saw with uh, ants and bees. Uh, the markets and economic agents, or economic systems, uh, are also considered classic uh, examples of complex systems. Uh, complex networks, like the World Wide Web, or networks between computers, how they grow, uh, the distribution they have about how many networks. They, they display some, these network, these graphs, when analyzed, they display some, some complex system uh, properties. Ecosystems, of course, where species evolve and adapt and interact, again, can generate these, these large patterns and have some emerging dynamics that is uh, different from the behavior that they would have um, uh, if the system could not interact uh, between many, many elements. Um, so the list of examples can go on. Uh, but now we can focus a little bit on what these complex systems uh, produce, not only the features that they, they exhibit, uh, the features of the characteristics that they have, but also what they are producing, uh, what we consider classical complex systems, what they are able to produce. And as I said, the key element perhaps is uh, that they produce this sort of a spontaneous order or also self-organization uh, in which a structure and these large scale patterns arise out of the interactions between parts without having any central uh, organizer. Again, that's kind of the key concept here. Uh, they also many times display some uh, structure or a structure of a structures. So they have some sort of hierarchy of structures at different levels, at different scales. It's not only that they produce one pattern, uh, one scale, and that's it. Many times they display order or a structure at different levels, at different scales. Sometimes this uh, is illustrated as some sort of hierarchy of, of structures, at multiple scales, uh, say clustering or and also a specialized of functions or modularity. Sometimes these elements, these ants, for example, some of them adopt some jobs, some of them adopt some other work. Uh, so at the end, out of the interactions, they can also get uh, specialized in concrete functions. So they have some this sort of modularity also. Uh, history and memory. So many of these complex systems carry a long, long history on their backs in the sense that how they behave in the beginning uh, can influence uh, the interactions that they will have far, far away in the future. So in many cases, they have a very long history and uh, they store information about this, this history. Uh, for example, in the case of the colony of ants that I'm using as a, some sort of running examples, I'm always going back to these ants, uh, the behavior of the colony as a whole, it changed over the years. If, for example, they survive and learn uh, after two years, colonies are much more likely to survive than if they don't make it during the first two years. So as a colony, they learn, they, they adapt to challenges, they learn how to react better to attacks of predators. So do you see that the group dynamics, the colony dynamics uh, is learning and its behavior has a long history. And finally, many uh, complex systems are able of adaptive behavior. So they modify their behavior depending on what is the state of the environment and what is the prediction they do about it. Maybe here a good example would be also economics. So the predictions about how the economy is going to go also shapes uh, the economy itself. Uh, and also, of course, uh, living systems uh, that learn, they show adaptive behavior. So again, this is some sort, of, this is the sort of, of patterns or structures uh, that complex systems produce. If they have the elements that I showed before, in many cases they will be able to produce these, uh, these features. And perhaps this example, you have seen it, but I think it's a nice example of self-organization. It's this uh, metronome synchronization that I would like to show. I've seen it many times, and maybe I'm sure you have seen it, but it's still spectacular, I think. So here you have metronomes that are started at different frequency of oscillation, a different phase in their oscillation. And they, they slightly interact because the, the momentum that uh, the, each of these pendulums display is transferred to the networks through the lateral movement of the table. This might not be the best example in the case because you have this table. But if you would add little springs to the mass of the pendulum between nearest networks in these 2D array of metronomes, 
you will end up with the same dynamics. That they will start at different frequencies, at different phases, but thanks to the interaction between them, you will see how they tend to a state of uh, order in a self-spontaneous manner. Right. I will pass the video because it takes several minutes. And again, this is a more ordered state. This is a more unique pattern. There are not so many configurations that uh, agree with this synchronous movement, right? While the dynamics are shown in the beginning, which each of them is going on its own, there are many, many patterns of, uh, uh, that uh, agree with that. So they kind of go to some more order state, some more particular pattern or structure. Huh? And again, in this state, if you would add a new metronome, this new metronome would be, its interaction with the networks would be totally shaped by this macro pattern, by this large scale uh, pattern. Hmm? So this is a classical example of self-organization or spontaneous uh, order. And again, here is perhaps kind of the key concept that is very difficult to define in complex systems, very difficult to pinpoint mathematically. But the way it is understood as a metaphor is this one in which local interactions between components. Here we have a network of nodes. You can consider each node one of these elements, many elements that I'm discussing about. And the edges you can consider as some sort of interaction. Okay? And importantly, these interactions are not fixed. The strength of interaction might depend on the state of the node itself. So you have, for example, here, you pick up two nodes. For example, out of this network of uh, elements interacting, you pick up two nodes. This edge would indicate that these elements are interacting. For example. And uh, what I'm saying is that this interaction doesn't need to be fixed. This interaction might depend on the, on the variable that is on this node and on the variable that is on this other node. So the interaction itself might depend on the state of the nodes that these two edges, that this edge join. Hmm? So this interaction is dynamic, and what I'm saying is that uh, what people understand as emerging behavior or uh, in complex system is the fact that these local interactions sometimes produce these macro patterns, as you saw with the synchronization example before, and these macro patterns again shape how these local interactions uh, take place again, some sort of feedback. Some people call it downward causation feedback. Hmm? But again, the idea is again that this Emergent scale or emergent pattern at large scale shapes back to the local interactions, okay? And this is what some people, uh, some characteristic uh, that people think that emergent phenomena should have and uh, how we believe that uh, most of complex systems produce this emergent behavior and why this emergent behavior is difficult to predict is because of this feedback loop. In order to know which pattern will arise, you need to follow a long history of, of feedback. And this dependency, if it's nonlinear, is very difficult to analytically track into which attractor is going to, which dynamic or the, which attractor is going to end up. Here's another slide used to, to exemplify, again, the complex of, of emergency and uh, self-organization. But again, the idea is the same thing. In this panel, uh, you see um, some sort of uh, size scale. So you start with many elements interacting locally uh, and how somehow these elements aggregate, forming some sort of clusters of, or uh, order. And these clusters themselves can aggregate again, forming some structure or order into higher scale until forming uh, perhaps the largest scale of order. And how, again, uh, this pattern shapes back how the local interactions take place dynamically. Uh, and then we speak in this case of when these patterns at certain scale produce order, we speak about some emergent property uh, that again, can, it's very hard uh, to be inferred from the behavior of the local components. If you could only study a couple of elements here of these little dots, two or three of them, how they interact locally, it would be very hard to predict which patterns they would produce because sometimes the patterns that is produced depends on having many, many, many elements here. Because when you have many, many, only when you have many, many elements, you can have these sort of global patterns that feed back to the local interactions. So what I'm saying is that in complex systems, one of the difficulties that we have is that uh, to study local, for example, in the case of ants, if you take just two ants and see what rules they follow, it's gonna be very difficult that you would predict that they form bridges and all this stuff because some, some of these dynamics depends on having many elements. Yes, interacting locally, but still having many so they can form these patterns that feed back the local interactions and shape these local interactions. So sometimes in complex systems, you have the difficulty that 
we know that everything is kind of uh, determined by the local rules. There is no magic here uh, with these patterns emerge. But nevertheless, it's very difficult to study this system by taking just a couple of elements and see how they interact. Because the way they interact when there are many, many others is different. Simply because when there are many others from this feedback loop with the macro scale, and if you study two ants alone, uh, probably you will not uh, be able to, to form bridges or these macrostructures. So hence the, the intrinsic difficulty in studying complex systems. Um, and what it emerges, sometimes we need to specify what is the thing that emerges. As I said, in many cases, it is emerges this order at this higher scale, uh, these mega patterns, if you wish. Uh, but sometimes the, the, the order that emerges is not so much these um, macro structures or macro patterns, but also some sort of dynamics or laws uh, or certain distributions that complex systems follow. Uh, and in many cases, uh, the distributions that these complex systems give rise, uh, they are very similar across uh, bit different disciplines. So sometimes you will find that uh, many of these complex systems follow similar rules or follow, sim sorry, follow similar uh, distributions even though they are from completely different disciplines. Or at the surface, the elements or the systems we are studying uh, look very different, but nonetheless, there is some sort of invariance or universal behavior that explains uh, that different systems uh, sometimes can follow very similar laws. Um, and one example is this sort of a scale invariance that many, uh, many uh, complex systems display. So this scale invariance referred to the fact that, for example, when you have a probability distribution or a, or a function in general, that is a power law, so f of x equals x raised to the power of some constant, alpha. What happens is now, if you scale x, so you send x to lambda x, when the, there is a power law, what occurs is that uh, this f of lambda x will be equal to lambda to the power of alpha multiplied by x to the power of alpha, and x to the power of alpha was f of x in the beginning. So then you find that when you send x to lambda x, uh, the function evaluated at that point equals the same, a constant multiplied by the function evaluated at the original point. So the power law of this, this uh, mathematical function is the only one that when you dilate, when you zoom in, when you stretch the variable x, you end up with the same law. You end up with the same function multiplied by a constant. Okay? If you do this for other functions, this will not be the case. If you do this for exponential, for example, if you stretch lambda x to become lambda x, then you will not end up with uh, a constant multiplied by the original function evaluated at x. Okay? So power law is basically, I think, the only solution, uh, but I'm not sure, to this uh, problem that f lambda of x equal a constant by f of x. And people refer to this to some sort of scaling variance in the sense that the function evaluated at the stretch uh, input variable looks the same as the original function. And many complex systems are able somehow to produce uh, distributions that follow this, this power law, that follow this, this sort of law. This, they display this sort of scaling variance. That when you look at the system at different scales, they look like the original system. When you zoom in, and reshape, you could, the zooming would look like as the original picture you started from, somehow. This is a metaphor, but this is what people have in mind when referred to scale invariance. Um, and the signature of this uh, power law, of this function, is that if you, when you take the log of the first equation, when you take the log on both sides, uh, you have the log of f of x equals alpha log of x. So when you plot this function in the log log coordinates, you end up with a question of, uh, of a line. So when this f of x actually is a probability distribution, the signature of this power law, of this scale invariance that many complex systems will display, is that the distribution, when you plot it in log-log coordinates, uh, this, dis this distribution takes the shape of a line. And again, complex systems from physics and from living life seems to, to many of them, seems to display these, these distributions with this sort of scale invariance or this sort of very particular distribution. We're not talking about a Gaussian here, we are talking about a very particular distribution that in log-log coordinates has the shape of a line. And that is uh, one of the signatures of a scale invariance. Hmm? So one of the 
conditions in which complex systems generate this sort of power loss is in some state, very particular state between order and chaos called criticality. So in criticality, for example, is uh, the state that occurs between, as I said, order and chaos. For example, when uh, you take a magnet, a magnet you can think composed of some sort of, uh, of uh, small uh, magnets, in this case are spins, we call it in physics, that can be oriented in two, okay, in two uh, directions, or two up or down. And the magnetization occurs when these systems with these uh, little magnets are all of them aligned into the same direction. In this case, you get a net magnetization and you, your material, your solid, have uh, magnetic properties. Uh, but these spins, they like to be aligned in the same direction. They have energy preference. They have lower state of energy when they align in the same direction, and they don't like to be in opposite directions. Okay? So then you could think, okay, then they should be all magnets. They like to uh, align themselves, so why they don't all of them align to the same direction? What happens is that temperature produces uh, random flips between these spins. So you have here one force tending to disorder, which is temperature, and one force that tends to order, which is the preferred alignment that these spins uh, interact. And then when you have uh, the case of high temperature, you take this two-dimensional lattice of these little spins, uh, then in high temperature, with the flicking of spins, you will obtain a graph like the one here on the right. And when, when you lower the temperature, as you lower more and more the temperature, the source of disorder is disappearing, so the systems will like to align into one of the two directions. So most of the spins, here, one direction is plot white, the other direction is plot black. But when you lower the temperature more and more and more, you will see that one of these two directions will win. Okay, so most of the pattern at some point will be white or will be black, depending on how the symmetry breaks but they will point in the same direction if you lower the temperature enough. But interestingly is that there is some critical temperature, so an intermediate state, some very particular temperature in which the system is said to exhibit uh, the state between uh, disorder and order, okay? There's a critical temperature at which this net alignment starts, and at that point, they form very interesting patterns. They form these patterns in which actually, if you would zoom in this image, the zooming image would look like the original image. In the sense, it displays this scale invariance. If you could take a zoom and you just reshape, the image could look like the original we started with. It shows this scale invariance property that I mentioned before. And this is called a critical state. It has many interesting properties, these fractal properties with a scale that I mentioned. And also, if you look at the size of the clusters, you also follow this some sort of power law distributions. Okay? So it's a very particular state uh, in which we know that systems very different, such as magnets, but also when water, when liquid water becomes ice, also shows this critical phase, this critical uh, stage. Okay? So again, we are talking about water and magnets, very different physical systems, but uh, there is some sort of invariance that makes that only some elements, only some characteristics of these uh, systems are relevant to display these, these properties. And both cases, they, they show it. They have this critical phase in which you have this uh, amazing statistics for the cluster size distribution that follow this, this power law, and they show this scale invariant. So when you zoom in, the image looks like uh, the original image, so to say. It's sort of fractal uh, structure in the scales. Um, but interesting, uh, as I said, other complex systems show also power loss or approximate power loss in their distributions. In this case, not in the distribution of clusters of these little magnets that form, but for example, in the, probably you're familiar with the SIP law, which says also that uh, in the case of the frequency of different words, that when you take a book uh, or a corpora, large enough, uh, the most common word, if you plot again the, in the log-log coordinates, in the x-axis would be kind of the rank of the words, so zero would be for the most common word, one for the second most common word, and so forth and so on, in the x-axis, and you take the log of it. Actually, maybe you start with one, of course. And if you take in the y-axis uh, the log of how many times this word appear, you will see that it forms, in this log-log coordinates, it forms an approximate, again, line. Of course, not perfectly, not for the full range, but there is some region, some range in which they form some sort of line. And again, this is a signature of this fat distribution or long tail distribution, uh, there are signature that is, is a power law, as I said before. 
Uh, and this, again, we are talking about magnets, we are talking about uh, liquid water becoming ice, uh, that have these particular distributions. Uh, we are talking about uh, frequency of words in, uh, in books or some corpora. Uh, also for city sizes, uh, how many people live in different cities. Uh, if you take, uh, for example, here somebody took uh, eight countries and plot the in logarithmic, logarithmic coordinates, the, the population of the city uh, versus the rank uh, of how the order in which the, this city is the first most populated, the second most populated. And when you move the rank towards the right, when you go from the first to the second to the third most populated city, again, uh, the log of the population decreases in a constant manner or in a constant fraction in these log-log uh, coordinates. Okay. So again, we have very different systems, but nonetheless, they display these, uh, these power law distributions. Okay, so this, of course, begs for a question of do they have something in common? Maybe they share some sort of mechanism uh, that for very different systems, nevertheless, they are able to produce these similar distributions. And this particular distribution. Uh, again, in many complex networks, also, for example, if you take the distribution of the degrees or the, or the networks to which each node is connected, and you do this statistic, you do distribution, you will find that many complex networks in biology and also in social systems uh, display, again, this sort of uh, decay. Uh, so uh, in this case, if you take, again, how many nodes have, for example, 100 friends or 100 networks, you will see that only one or two nodes uh, uh, have that property. But when you decrease the number of networks, how many, for example, you ask how many nodes have 10 networks, there are many more of these cases, many more of these nodes that have only 10 networks. And again, when you plot this over, over the range of networks that, uh, or the distribution of degree or networks of, of the nodes, in many cases you obtain, again, this power law with different slopes, okay, depending on the concrete system. But nevertheless, in many of them, for some ranges, they display this sort of linear behavior. There is a lot of debate, these power laws, how well they can be measured, for how many, for how big has to be the range for it to qualify as a power law. So there is a big discussion in the topic. But nevertheless, you see that many complex systems uh, evolve towards this sort of power law distributions. Okay? And I'm talking again about systems that nobody would relay in principle. Magnets, water, cities, frequency of words, uh, you name it. And uh, Complex systems, science have been able to identify a few mechanisms at least that are able to give rise to this sort of power law, uh, power law distributions. One of them I mentioned in the beginning with this criticality state, this state between order and disorder, or if you wish, between order and chaos, this particular state in between uh, where order starts emerging. Uh, and at that critical state, uh, the system displays these power law distributions, for example, in the size of clusters and things like that. Uh, but, of course, that would be very particular observation because criticality occurs only at one particular temperature of a physical system. It occurs only at one particular parameter. Uh, but uh, one discovery in complexity designs is something called self-organized criticality in which, actually, you don't need to precisely tune the parameter, in this case of temperature, to obtain this critical behavior, but rather the system tends toward this criticality. So it would be like this criticality is some attractor state. And therefore, you don't need to precisely adjust the parameter to be in the critical state, kind of the system evolves naturally uh, toward a critical state. And therefore, it will be a robust observation. because You don't need to precisely set the parameter to be operating in that regime. Uh, you start from some other parameters, and then kind of the dynamics of the system tends towards a critical state. So this is uh, the notion of self-organized criticality. Uh, then preferential uh, processes like this uh, rich get richer phenomena. Uh, this type of phenomena also leads to these power law distributions, also in economy with Pareto law and this type of distributions of wealth uh, in which rich get richer uh, mechanisms can explain uh, preferential attachment or this type of preferential mechanisms can explain the origin of some of these power laws. Finally, multiplicative processes. If the variable you're interested in is not the result of a summation, if there are, for example, if your random variable you're interested in uh, for your complex system is the result of a summation of all the random variables. We have the central limit theorem, which says that under very generic conditions, they will st this will tend towards an exponential. But if you have a multiplicative process where you have the, your random variables, the result of the multiplication of random variables, uh, in many cases, this will tend uh, to a log normal distribution, which is not a power uh, law, but it has also a heavy tail. 
And therefore, in many cases, the power law or the log normal are debated which one fits better these complex systems distribution. But what I'm saying is that multiplicative process can also give rise to these uh, heavy tails or fat distributions. And finally, one latest mechanism identified by complex systems uh, to produce this power law, or this scaling, uh, are sample state reductions. So this refers to systems in which uh, in the beginning of your process, for example, imagine you have a ball sitting in, the, in this item number 13, and the process is described as, okay, the ball can go to randomly anywhere between the points or the items before, from 1 to 12, and makes a jump. And from that point on, it can only, it takes a random jump, but it has to be always towards the left. If you start this process many, many times, again, the statistics of, of how often are visited each of these items, I follows a power law distribution. Here is a drone without the logarithms. That's why it looks like this. Uh, but you can see that this law is i to the power of minus one. Uh, so therefore, it's a power law. And you would plot it in log log coordinates. You will see, again, this, this line. And this has been one of the mechanisms proposed. There are many mechanisms proposed to, for example, how the SIP flow applies to the frequency of words in corpora. And this has been one of the, the, um, the mechanisms that has been proposed for how uh, words uh, follow this particular distribution for how often they appear in corpora. And the idea is that when you begin in the beginning of the, a sentence, uh, you have in the beginning, you have more freedom about how the sentence will start. And when you move towards further words, you have less freedom into which are the next words that can appear next to the words that you already selected. For example, if at the beginning of your word, uh, of your sentence, you have uh, the cloud, after there, you have a lot of options. What comes after D? Article D. So you have many options. Then you choose cloud. After cloud, you have less options, right? Can be cloud, gray, cloud, runs, cloud, announces. You have less options. And when you commit to, for example, announces, you have even less options about what would be the next word. Can be announces win or announces a storm, but it's not going to be announces while or announces house, right? So this phenomenon in which when you run the process, you have less and less options can also be has been identified as one of the mechanisms generating uh, power loss. And this has been exp uh, used to, to also explain how frequency, how the frequency of words in, in corpora could also arise. I must say, for many of these things, there are several explanations. Okay? Some people think this is one of the mechanisms intervening in generating this power loss for the frequency of words, but there are others. Uh, so, but I the, the main point here I want to say is, again, we have systems with many different origins, and sometimes they have this sort of common laws, in this case, power laws, and complex systems have been critical to identify the common mechanisms or potential mechanisms underlying how these laws, these regularities, these distributions, particular distributions, can appear for systems that are so different. I have a question. So, um, all of these are very descriptive describe what is the structure, observe what was there. Mm -hmm. But can it be reversed, sort of like to, to engineer new systems or to engineer, build something from bottom up where you can be somehow designed robustly somehow? I think now, now, we are, now we are kind of observing what has happened in the past. Mm -hmm. We observe that there are all these laws um, and mm -hmm. try to say why is that, but Mm -hmm. How do we actually utilize this? Well, I think once you identify the mechanism, for example, then you can use this mechanism to create the distributions in the first place. But that would be kind of designing the statistics. But if uh, from a bottom up, I think it's, it's difficult to, to generate a complex system, almost by its definition, because these feedback loops, again, it's very difficult to predict how you put some local rules, what is going to emerge as a macrostructure, and how this is going to feed back the local interactions, it's very difficult. So one of the, the, the hallmarks of complex systems that people say is that this intrinsic difficulty to see how things will evolve over time, which order will, will appear. But I think, of course, if once you pinpoint some mechanisms, if you produce that mechanism in your system, at least some of these statistics that we are seeing should be able to engineer them, right? Um, for example, for this power law about the, um, the fact that there are some nodes with a lot of networks and progressively you have uh, more nodes with uh, less networks. This power law we saw for the degree distribution. Of course, when you know the preferential attachment, the fact that imagine you start growing the, the, the network. You start with some nodes and then you take another node and you say, okay, 
I'm going to put more probability to link this node to the node that has more edges rather than to the node that have less edges. If you follow this recipe, of course, you will end up with a power law. Uh, so once you know the mechanism, yes, you can engineer back some of these distributions. But the function that they will meet, the order that they will create, uh, this feedback loop makes it difficult to, to reverse engineering uh, many of these functions, I would say. And here is a list, it's impressive, the list of, uh, of, of distributions in complex systems that follow uh, these power laws or approximated power laws. So here we have city size, and here is the mechanism that they argue uh, in a given reference about creating the, these statistics. Uh, rainfalls, uh, hurricane damages, uh, interbug loans, so even moon crater diameters. Uh, I don't know, it's impressive to see sometimes how so different systems can have this common law of power law. But as I said, in many cases, it's not clear exactly which is the mechanism that produces it. All we have is a guess that we know these four, five, six mechanisms that we know generate the power law, but which exactly is the complex system relying on to, to build this uh, or to emerge these distributions is, is, is difficult, difficult to pinpoint. And again, uh, this list is, is very long. Uh, you have also the magnitude of earthquakes is distributed as a power law. Um, and there they claim that self-organized criticality in the tectonic plate is responsible for having this, this magnitude of earthquakes distribution that we observe, uh, you name it. Um, and again, that's the interesting part of complex systems when you see that some patterns are common uh, regardless of the, not regardless, but uh, for very different systems. So a few lessons we learned, I think, from, from complexity science over the years is that uh, Perhaps this slogan that more is different by Philip Anderson, Nobel Prize in Physics, is kind of the slogan of, of complex systems that sometimes uh, when you add more elements, the way they interact, the way they produce this pattern shapes the local interactions back. And therefore, sometimes it's difficult to know how things will operate from a study just how two, three elements will interact. Sometimes you need to study. Sometimes the size is really important to, to understand how the systems will, will behave. Um, that non-living systems can generate order that uh, complexity can arise from simplicity. Uh, I think many times in society we think that, oh, this is a very complex pattern, this is something uh, very complicated, therefore it must have been some very involved mechanism behind. Sometimes not, sometimes it emerges from very simple rules. Uh, that coordinated behavior on these structural patterns do not need a controller or a central element to dictating what others should do. Also that, of course, many ways we model complex system is through some network of interactions, uh, networks in which the edges also evolve according to the dynamics of the nodes. So it's a very, very dynamic and adaptive uh, network, uh, adapting both the state of the nodes and the state of the interaction or the edges. So where everything is dynamic, the edges, uh, the strength of the edges and the, the values uh, of the variables at the nodes. And also we have learned, as we have showed lately, that there are invariances. There still there are some sort of universal behavior that allow us to speak about complexity science, that allow us to see commonalities between systems that in principle belong to very different uh, fields. Mm -hmm. And maybe the last 10 minutes, I would like to use it uh, to, to say that in some sense, complex systems, we can say that they also compute. Okay? And this is something that maybe we, we, don't, uh, we don't think uh, enough. Uh, so let me quote uh, Abby Bidgerson. Uh, Abby Bidgerson is a theoretical computer scientist, a mathematician. He won the Abel Prize for mathematics last year. He's also a Turing Award and the Valina Prize. So, I mean, and he, he, he quotes in a book, computation is the evolution process of some environment by a sequence of simple local steps. And then he goes to say, maybe you think many of the examples I showed before or many of the Samples or systems in nature or even in technology could comply to this definition, could, could, could be uh, matched with this definition. And then he goes to saying, if this definition seems to you as capturing practically any natural process you know of, that's precisely how I want it to, to sound. So he goes basically to say that computation is everywhere. The computation is not only bits evolving in some hardware in a computer, but also it's computers in a network, atoms in matter, um, what else he wrote? Neurons in the brain, proteins in a cell, cells in a tissue, prices in market, stars in galaxies, friends on Facebook, and so on and so on. So according to him, the central 
notion of computation, basically it's any system that evolves by some local and sealed simple steps by following some rules because they will compute some sort of function and that is also uh, a computational process. Not only bits evolving according to some rules that we put in a, in a computer, but anything that evolves according to some rules, it will compute a function. Okay? And that is what's called computation. Um, of course, we know examples of these cellular automata, like the game of life, in which, again, there are very simple rules and they are shown to be pure and complete. But I mean more, uh, not only this, uh, but I mean really that in some sense, when you think about Turing machine, and you have the, the tape and the symbols you read from the head and changing the, the state, uh, at the end, if you think about it, this can be described as three equations in which you change the, the symbol that you write, the state, and the direction of movement of the head as a function of the symbol you just read and, uh, and the state. This is basically uh, the conceptualization of a Turing machine. When F, T, and H, you normally give it as some sort of table. You can think of them as some sort of function. But at the end, many of these complex systems are not complex systems. But many of the systems we, we describe in nature, we model them through equations. So the way they evolve, the way they change, we also model it through some sort of rules. You, to model a system, you describe some set of variables that you think describe your system and give some sort of updating rules. What is the state of these variables, the next time step? And normally, many of these complex systems, they are modeled through differential equations, which all they give is how the variable x, uh, the rate of change of variable x depends on the state of all other variables and possibly time. So some sort of rules, in this case with normally continuous functions, but at the end, and these variables in all these, they are continuous themselves. But nevertheless, it's just some sort of rules of how things change, evolve over time. And of course, you can discretize these equations, uh, and they have to show many, they can show many interesting dynamics such as chaos. But the important thing is that at the end of the day, this just says some sort of function over time. It's some sort of reiteration of the same function, the same rule applied to how the trajectory or how the system evolves over time. And of course, you can do that with continuous time. You can also do that with discrete time. Then we call it maps. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's the same thing. You, you generate some output as a function of some input following some local simple rule. And at the end, of course, you iterate. In a dynamical system, the only difference is that you close the loop. You, every time, uh, basically, the, same the function is applied to the initial condition. It produces some new state. The new state is fed to the same function again, producing a second state, and so forth and so on. So the dynamical system, in some sense, you can see that the trajectory or the evolution of a dynamical system is nothing else than the reiteration of the same function applied over time. And in that sense, I think it becomes a bit more clear why I think Abby Bidgerson and many people think that any system that we describe by some sort of simple local rules in which the elements evolve through these rules can be also considered a computation. At the end of the day, all you are doing is iterating the output, putting it back to the input, and so forth and so on. Like this sequence of, of uh, reiterations or recurrence uh, to generate the trajectory of the system. So my point is that the state of a system through its trajectory is nothing else than the result of applying some recurrent function over time. And that from that point of view, it's not so difficult, or maybe it's the analogy of thinking that not only bits in a computer com or built in some sort of hardware compute, but basically, many of the systems that I show, they compute some function. It's not maybe the function that we program, but they evolve according to some set of rules, and that is probably worth to be called it also a computational process, in some sense. And I think that is, of course, I'm not in the mind of Abby Bidgerson, but I think that's what he meant, or what he tries to capture by saying that everything computes. When he said, when he wrote that, if this definition seems to just capturing practically any natural process, that's precisely how I want it to sound. And therefore, he also argues that even without computers, computer science should have been in invented because it allows to describe uh, the evolution of systems, uh, not only computers. And perhaps the last, last point that I want to mention is that I think maybe we have nowadays uh, a lot of machine learning, uh, computer science, and that's, of course, very nice and very interesting how to go from data to fitting some sort of predictive uh, system in order to gain knowledge or predictions or decisions. Uh, but in some cases, when the system of study is maybe the system that originates this data, 
I think Eike also got some questions this morning about sometimes the perfect model is the, the, the model that generates the data itself. That's basically the best you can have. And many times, of course, it's difficult to model the, the system, and sometimes it's hard enough to get data, and you are happy to, to analyze the data. But in some cases, sometimes if your interest is really in the system that generates the data, sometimes we can go through machine learning or some sort of statistical model, but sometimes we can also try to simulate the system itself. And sometimes, as I show, very complex behavior, very complex data might be produced by simple rules mm -hmm. that we can simulate and therefore uh, and change parameters to understand qualitatively the system that generated the data. And um, later on, of course, we can try to find these patterns, these signatures of order that I mentioned in these complex systems. And I would argue that machine learning sometimes is becoming so complicated, and especially in reinforcement learning, in which there is a loop between the behavior of the, of the model, of the, in case, many cases, deep learning networks, and the environment, and this feedback loop, my question whether uh, at some point we will get to the point that the machine learning system itself uh, displays some features of complex systems. And indeed, people have been studying a little bit how uh, different, uh, different things in artificial neural networks, the scale, which order they produce, uh, the attractors, when we talk about recurrent neural networks, they, they produce. And maybe it's worth to speculate about the question whether uh, some intelligent behavior might benefit perhaps even need some complex system uh, features. Um, and with this, I think I'm running almost out of time. I would like to, to conclude uh, by saying that maybe if at the end of this talk you think a little bit that maybe computing is everywhere, not only in computers, and you are able to think that uh, it's very interesting the patterns that local simple rules generate sometimes, uh, and they merge this, this structure out of very simple rules. Uh, maybe next time you go, for a walk in nature, you would be able to appreciate some other system that we haven't discussed here and realize about how beautiful it is, the emergence uh, that it produces. And with this note, uh, I finish. Thank you. Um, let's, let's ask some questions. I have one that I want to ask from you as being trained in physics, brain, lots mm -hmm. of uh, differential equations. So I have noticed that um, um, the neuroscientist Mart Sarman here, Professor Martlock, who are doing this um, um, synthetic biology, somehow they, they tend to have the impression that computers cannot model those mm -hmm. continuous processes because computers are by definition discrete, right? Mm -hmm. Working with the bits and, and, and bytes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Somehow, what is your take on that? I take, uh, at the end, I will quote also Abby Bidgerson. In, Abby Bidgerson has a book called Mathematics and Computations. At the end, at the end he says that everything at the end can be modeled uh, with discrete variables. And his argument is that every mathematical book ever written at the end is a collection of, of symbols, of discrete symbols. So at the end, you can define everything with discrete symbols. So I think in principle, I think discrete, uh, discreteness is enough to model even uh, even what we see in nature, even we think is continuous. So in principle, my personal point of view is that I don't see a fundamental uh, block uh, by which computers cannot emulate uh, brains just because they are discrete. I don't see that uh, as an obstacle. Another question is whether sometimes in analog computing, uh, for example, is the notion that sometimes in hardware, uh, in principle running on ana analog rules, on continuous variables and continuous time evolution, some computations might be easier to perform, simply because the functions that they, by which they evolve uh, might be easier, particularly suited for some computations. But in principle, I believe in the church turing hypothesis that anything can be, that we can reasonably believe call an algorithm, can be implemented by computers, and I see the brain not as an exception to that. So in principle, if you ask me at least, I would say that I don't see any obstacle by which computers cannot emulate a, a brain. But a different question is the architectures that we have. The, architectures, the current architectures that we have is the best or the most suitable to, to emulate the brain or to displace properties. That I don't know, but it's, that is more a matter of efficiency or matching rather than in principle being not possible. Uh, so this is a very interesting topic, and I think it could have potentially like endless depth to it, depending on which areas you approach. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any books you would recommend for someone who's trying to get into this without necessarily doing like a literature review on all the mm -hmm. different 
complex system. John Holland, one of the authors I mentioned in the beginning, which is considered one of the fathers of genetic algorithms, he has a book called Emergence, and it's exactly about that, how, uh, what he meant, what people in complex systems meant uh, by complexity. And there is another book by Nobel Prize um, Murray Gelman called The Quark and the Jaguar, and it's uh, all about uh, complex systems, complexity science, and uh, he was the, the founder of the Santa Fe Institute also. So I would suggest these two, Emergence by John Holland, and uh, also this, um, The Quark and the Jaguar by Murray Gelman. I think these are very popular books, but they still get you into the flavor of this emergency and, and what complex system is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks Raul. Uh, you mentioned that it's very difficult to construct a complex system uh, like from the ground up but how easy it is to modify an existing complex system. I'm, I'm sometimes thinking about the climate and ecological crisis, and currently like all the goals are very distant, they're global, and they're very complex, but maybe should we more focus on local and simple changes? Yeah, I think maybe you are tapping a bit on the, what is control theory perhaps, or controllability, what modification you need in order to bring the state of a system to a particular uh, configuration, for example. And control systems, of course, uh, they are, for complex systems, I guess, is, is, uh, they are difficult. But also because uh, I think it's, uh, again, it's very difficult sometimes from simple rules to get the system to evolve towards your desired state. And um, for example, think in, in social systems. There was this case uh, in which uh, there was some kindergarten uh, that uh, parents were arriving late to pick up their children. And then in the kindergarten, they decide to put a penalty to pay, let's say, $10. Uh, if you arrive uh, to pick up your kindergarten out of hours. And with the reasoning that if they put this rule, parents will come earlier to pick up their children. They will not come late. It happened absolutely the opposite. Parents were interpreting, okay, now I'm paying, so therefore I'm entitled to pick up my children late. So it happened exactly the opposite. So it's very difficult in systems, in social systems, systems made of many elements, or it's very difficult to see how rewards, for example, reward is how we try to shape society, right, in, in politics and everything. But it's very difficult sometimes some of these rewards, for example, might counter, be counterproductive. Um, so I don't know much about the topic of controllability, but I think that, again, bottom-up approach is difficult to predict what the system will end up uh, doing. I think it's harder. I think the best thing I think we can do is try to simulate or try to be based on experience how similar systems acted and hope that some sort of robustness between systems will, will act and they try to Try to learn by experience is the only thing, because by emergence, it's difficult. Uh, I don't say it's impossible, but it seems that sometimes it can backfire. Uh, uh, my question is about uh, patterns. You know, you, you, uh, you mentioned that the definition of a complex system is very difficult, and there's many. And the couple of them that you showed, they had the word pattern in them. Sorry, can you repeat the last thing? Uh, so patterns? You know, in complex systems that are uh, like observable easily, or for example, the uh, uh, power law, um, are there any def definitions that wouldn't really confine to these uh, elements? Because I, I, I'm wondering that these are the elements that are observable to us as humans, but there might be complex systems that don't really display these uh, elements. So what do you think about that? I must say, I didn't understand uh, acoustically. Part of the question. So okay. Uh, uh, perhaps the microphone was a bit far. Uh, sorry. Uh, so basically, any definitions that wouldn't confine the complex systems to patterns or power law, you know, because these are things that I am wondering are observable to us as humans, but there might be some patterns that we can't observe, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, and even these patterns, the, the power law is not, uh, uh, is some sort of signature of complex system, but there might be other systems that don't qualify as complex that also produce power law. So everything I said, it needs to be taken with, with a grain of salt in the sense these are some signatures of complex systems, but they are not uh, necessary, neither sufficient to qualify for a system as a complex. So for sure, there might be other patterns that we don't describe or we don't quantify. Even the question of quantification is very hard. There are some definitions of complexity between something that is not fully ordered and not fully random, you know, and people try to come with definitions using entropy or some modifications in order to describe this quantify something as complex between these two, order and chaos. But again, there is no agreement. So uh, I'm sure there are patterns that we don't have not quantified and vice versa. Some of the patterns that I show, not because your system has a power law, it means it's complex. Uh, it's just, it, they tend to be 
uh, but again, not is nothing of what I said is basically uh, written in a stone. It's just some tendencies, some commonalities, but uh, yeah, the signatures are to be taken with a grain of salt. So it's my turn, or is it too late? <laughs> no, please. I, I just wanted to ask, uh, I don't know whether you ever came across this uh, notion of an eco-rhythm. This is eco a term that was uh, coined by Leslie Valiant, uh, mm -hmm. theoretical computer scientist. Yes, yes, Leslie Valiant. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> because um, doesn't that fit very well, actually, with this idea of computing is everywhere? Mm -hmm. uh, so you mean that uh, this eco-rhythm fits well with the idea of computing everywhere? Yeah. Okay, I'm not familiar with, uh, you mean Leslie Varian, the one who also proved that the, the permanent is uh, NP, you mean the theoretical computer scientist, right? Yeah, uh, no, he, no mathematician, basically. He's, yeah. yeah, he's yeah. quite well known also for uh, introducing this PEC model. Uh, probably yes, yes, probably yeah. approximately uh, correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he, he recently wrote a, a popular book uh, in which he introduced this notion of an eco-rhythm, okay. which is an artificial term, uh, mm -hmm. combi combination of yeah, basically the idea of having an algorithm in a kind of ecosystem. So he has an mm -hmm. algorithmic view on nature and evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I think this fits very well, actually, with okay. this idea mm -hmm. uh, that you sketched there. Computation is basically everywhere. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't know. I think I, re I, I have mm. heard the term, but I haven't read the, the, the then word. I recommend you to do Thank so. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, will, I will take a look. Thanks. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, complex or not is is binary. Uh, so, but we could then ask mm -hmm. like there are definitely complex systems that are more complex mm -hmm. than some others. Uh, is there some kind of work to? Uh, there are there's something called complexity measures that that try to to pick up that notion of uh, yeah how complex are things? Uh, can you put a number, a scalar, into this is more complex than these others? But I find that work very difficult because at the end we try to summarize everything with a scalar. We try to put everything on a line and say this is more, this is less. When these systems, to describe them, they are multivariate. They have many features that you could uh, use them to describe. So I find it difficult always to pin down everything to a single number. So I'm not very, very uh, fond of, there have been many proposals. As I said, one of them is, uh, for example, compression, how much you can compress the system. Uh, algorithmic complexity has been a, a, a proposed measure of complexity of a system, you know, how much you can compress this pattern. Uh, and again, complex has been called something between order and chaos, or order and totally randomness. And yeah, there are some proposals that peak somewhere in the middle somehow, if you modify the distribution. But again, we would be simplifying everything to a single number. So it seems difficult to capture all the regions of these things with a single number. Uh, but so has has kind of complexity science um, been able to do um, really get some results on uh, kind of not at complexity level one, but actually two or three like uh, cases where there are multiple mechanisms already being combined? Or I mean, I mean, eventually we might want to get to understanding life. Uh, um, how it uh, started and all of that from that mathematical framework of, uh, of complexity science, right? Yeah, ideally, yes. But I think that the most successful story is perhaps that one of explaining this, this sort of the criticality can be an attractor state, so you don't need just a precise parameter, that this order can emerge for simple uh, rules. But of course, the problem of life, I mean, still, I think we don't have the tools yet to understand uh, even coevolution or when the edges and the nodes, everything could evolve. Like at the end, when we have the simple rules, at the end, uh, you know, the systems cannot be solved analytically. So I think in most cases, the most we can do is somehow apply bifurcation theory to try to understand the different qualitative uh, possible regimes. Uh, and I think at the end, many of the understanding is qualitative because analytically, they don't have nice clean solutions. All we can do in many cases is simulate them and try to come with some sort of mechanism to explain the statistics uh, or the regularities that they, they show. But at the end, in many cases, you just have to simulate them uh, because we cannot comp simplify the, the rules more or we cannot describe analytically where they evolve. So everything is very qualitative in many cases. So uh, let's thank Raul.